I am truly running out of options. My employers refuse to take my reports and have even threatened termination of my contract if I bring these events back to the table again. The local authorities are dismissive, or even worse, accuse me of substance abuse and mental instability. I can't even tell my own family, lest they draw the same conclusions. I wouldn't want to drag them into this anyway. Hopefully, some of you people can help me. At least help me understand what is going on. I have worked as a forester in Appalachia for a logging company that will go unnamed for nearly a decade now. In that time, I have come to love my job, the woods, and the freedom that accompanies both. But things have started to change with my most recent assignment. God, the woods used to feel so safe, so clean. Now, I can't stop my hands from shaking when I stand beneath the green canopy. So, now that we're on the same page, I'll walk you through the fieldwork of my profession. First, the company assigns me a tract of land they have recently acquired. I do some less exciting prep work in the office, satellite imaging, GIS, property analysis, etc. And then I head out into the field. Generally, the sites are pretty far from the offices, requiring multiple hour drives and overnight camping. I bring along some simple camping gear, tape measures, manual clinometer and altimeter, bright neon orange marking spray paint, and my GPS transmitter and marker. All in all, a bunch of technical nonsense that lets me determine the value of trees, which should be logged and which should be left behind to ensure no permanent damage is done to the forest. Simply enough. It was early morning on September 21st, 2019, when my office desktop pinged that I had an incoming email. Seeing that it was an assignment from corporate, I opened it up and nearly let out a cheer in my cubicle. The tract I had been assigned was a huge patch of old growth forest located near the Monongahela National Forest in West Virginia. For those of you who don't know, an old forest growth is a wooded area that has not been disturbed for hundreds of years, allowed to grow and develop in its natural state without intervention by farming, construction or logging. Many old growths haven't been touched since the settlers arrived, and some even before then. In any case, this was a cause for celebration. Old growth is increasingly rare and amazingly beautiful, and I was the one assigned to explore it. Of course, this was bittersweet, seeing as I would be the last to see it undespoiled before I gave the loggers the go-ahead. I spent the morning in the office packing my things and loading them into the tiny white Ford Ranger, lovingly nicknamed Piper, that the company had provided to me when I started working for them. She was a rugged little thing, having carried me through the mountains for almost a decade without protest. Of course, she wasn't without her quirks. Crank-operated windows, a rattling tailgate, and an AC that hadn't functioned since 2011. But I love that tiny little truck. Piper and I set out around noon, making good time on the four-hour drive through the rugged depths of West Virginia. We arrived at the old trailhead that would deliver me to my tract late into the afternoon. As I strapped my heavy backpack on and locked Piper up for her stay on the edge of the woods, I breathed deeply, taking in the heavy scent of forest earth and the sound of wind and birdsong through the treetops. Giving my truck a pass on the hood, I turned and made my way off the country road and onto the narrow dirt track that wound into the woods. The hike to the old growth stand of trees took about an hour of brisk trekking, the path becoming more and more overgrown as I progressed. It was obvious this trail hadn't been consistently used for years, probably decades. Nearly to my destination, I happened across what should have been the first sign that something was not right. An ancient sycamore tree stood in the dead center of the path, had it been any other species, I would have sidestepped it and kept plugging ahead. But sycamores had always been my favorite trees. So, I craned my neck upwards to admire the old beauty. About 12 feet off the ground, twisted and woven through a tangle of white barked branches, was the decomposing skeleton of a deer. Scraps of rotting fur and mummified tendons, the only things holding the carcass together as it dangled from the tree. I gasped and stepped back from the initial shock, the staring, skeletal visage of an old deer being the last thing I had expected to see. My first thought 
was that a mountain lion or similar predator had hauled the animal up there to feast upon. Carnivores like that were pretty rare in the area, but I had guessed it wasn't entirely out of the question. But my confusion spiked, and the rumblings of dread gestated in my gut when I looked just a little bit closer. It was difficult to tell due to the distance from the forest floor and amount of time the deer had been up there, but as I squinted and stared, I noticed something haunting. The decrepit animal remains were not simply jumbled into the tree branches, they were lashed into place by scraps of rope and cloth. Someone had hauled that deer 12 feet up the sycamore tree and tied its limbs and joints so it would stay suspended up there. Directly beneath the nearly completely rotted animal, barely visible due to age, was carved a simple O, presumably slashed into the bark by whoever took the time to create this macabre installation. I was understandably shocked and confused by this discovery, but the apparent age of the carving and carcass eased my worries a little. Whoever had done this had obviously done their work months ago. I resolved that until I happened across fresher work, I was unlikely to run into anyone else out here in the woods. Having reassured myself for the moment and excited to lay my eyes on rare old growth, I carried on down the trail towards my destination. I reached the edge of my assigned stand around 6.30 that night, the old ill-maintained trail terminating in a small clearing on the border of the forest I'd hiked through and the secluded acres of the old growth that waited beyond. I gazed, awestruck, at what waited for me. Ancient gnarled tree trunks that soared stories high, capped with dense foliage that cast the groves in a placid twilight. One of the defining features of old growth is a lack of an understory. Smaller plants choked by sunlight by the canopy above. This means that you can see much further than you could in a different forest, where brush and vines might block your view. In the old growth ahead of me, I could see deep into the canopy shaded woods. Darkness enveloping trees that grew in twisted and gnarled shapes ancient beings shaped by countless years into warped and beautiful lines. I was nearly overtaken by the sight, a few that so few people are able to look upon in this modern age. Even though I was nearly shaking with excitement to explore the acres large stand of forest ahead of me, I knew that daylight would not last much longer. I would have to push off starting my work until the next day, working quickly to pitch my tent and create a small stone ring to act as my fire pit before nightfall overtook my new campsite. That first night on the edge of the old growth was quiet. As I lay tightly wrapped in my sleeping bag, staring up through the vent net in the roof of my tent towards the stars above, I heard almost none of the sounds one might expect from camping deep in the woods. No night birds called, no insects buzzed, the only sounds were the rushing of wind through the leaves and once the mournful sound of an owl hooting somewhere within the ancient grove beyond my camp. I sat there awake in the eerie silence nearly the entire night, partially perturbed by the quiet, but mostly entranced by the beauty of the starlit sky and filled with excitement for the day to come. I eventually drifted off to sleep around 2am. At 5.30 in the morning, I was awoken by the electronic chirping of my watch alarm, signalling the start of my day. Groggily sitting up, I immediately regretted not forcing myself to sleep earlier. Yanking the zipper of my tent flap and exposing myself to the chill morning air, I rose to a stoop and began to exit my tent. As my head left the tent, I stopped, dead, frozen and staring. I was staring down the barrel of a pump-action shotgun, clutched in the hands of a middle-aged bearded man. He wore old flannel and denim, a stained old baseball cap over a mop of greying hair. His face was cracked and split by intricate wrinkles, the telltale aging enjoyed by a man who had spent his life outdoors. His grey eyes squinted as he met my shocked gaze, lowering the gun. Well, damn. I'm sorry, son. Didn't expect anybody. What the hell do you mean you didn't expect anybody? 
I asked, anger boiling to the surface as the shock of surprise ebbed away. You walked into a campsite at five in the morning. Why wouldn't there be anybody here? His dark face didn't change from his stony demeanor. Look, boy, I said I was sorry. No harm, no foul, right? He shrugged nonchalantly, irritatingly dismissive of the fact that he had a loaded gun pointed between my eyes mere moments ago. He slung the weapon over his shoulder and extended a hand to help me out of my tent. Most tents you find up here are empty. It took a moment for what he had said to sink in. What do you mean? Like people come up here to dump their trashed old equipment? Disappointment began to brew as the thought of the old growth filled with trash entered my mind. Nah, son, nothing like that. Just exactly what I said. The tents you find up here are always empty. The name's Randy. Randy Davidson. This plot belonged to my grandpa and his grandpa before him. His West Virginia drawl was thick and slow as he gestured towards the old growth stand. Before Grandpa sold it to the National Forest folks, eminent domain and whatnot. I furrowed my brow. Not only had I had the shock of my life less than a minute ago, now I was listening to the family history of some Appalachian backwater hick. My patience grew thin. So is that why you go poking around in other people's business? Scaring them half to death when they wake up? For old time's sake? Randy squinted again unimpressed with my impatience. Look, boy, all I'm gonna say is you better watch yourself out in these woods. Grandpa used to tell stories, was happy to have the feds take the land off his hands. Just pack up and leave is my advice. And with that, he turned and started walking away in the direction he came from. I stood there in uneasy silence and just watched him go. What the hell? Was that a warning or a threat? And what could he have possibly meant about empty tents? His message had surprised and confused me as much as this sudden appearance in my camp. The early morning light grew brighter and the mist that clung to the ground burned away as I gathered my things and prepared for my first foray into the old growth stand. I nearly inhaled my breakfast, excited to start my work. Then, pack filled and secure, I stepped beyond the edge of the grove. The old growth was breathtaking. Ancient gnarled trees surrounded me as I walked, dark twisting shapes disappearing into the shadowy canopy high above. No underbrush cluttered the ground, just stoic old boulders and thick sheets of soggy moss. The dense cover of leaves above cast the entire huge stand in the eerie pall of cool shade. The heavy scent of loamy earth and wet wood filled my nose and lungs pristine silence filled the forest. I set to work immediately, invigorated by my utterly gorgeous surroundings. The noise I made was the only sound to echo through the ancient woods around me, joining the quiet wind in the leaves above. I identified species, measured trunk diameters, calculated height and slope, judged quality timber from the trees best left standing. God damn, I thought to myself, Almost all of these trees were worth thousands of dollars in timber as individuals. This stand of old growth alone would likely net the company over a million dollars after harvest. How in hell had this place not been logged yet? With a metallic rattle and aerosol hiss, I marked the trees that would be harvested with my flagging paint. With the forest floor so clear of undergrowth, the bright orange X's I sprayed on the tree trunk could be seen in the distance in every direction looming out of the darkness in their obvious, unnatural neon hue. It felt strange to be painting this place, so long left beyond the reach of humanity. It was after 4pm, and I was finishing up the last sections of the stand I had decided to work on today. It was a small, low valley near the centre of the old growth, edged by mossy boulders and muddy slopes. I had nearly finished marking the chosen trees in the valley, when I came across something hauntingly strange. As I rounded the massive trunk of a beautiful old red oak, I saw it. Sitting in the middle of a tiny clearing, shaded by the dark leaves above, was the rusted hulk of an old RV. The paint was chipped and peeled away, almost to the point of non-existence, though there was still enough left to make out the classic script of Winnebago. 
The tires were flat, flaccid sacks of rubber draped over rusted hubcaps. Moss grew over the windows of the abandoned vehicle, at least where the glass hadn't shattered and dropped away. The side door hung limply open on failing hinges, revealing nothing but inky darkness inside. I slowly approached the derelict vehicle, wet moss and leaves squelching under my boots. How did this thing get down here? There was no way it could have driven down the steep slopes of the valley, and there weren't any signs that it had fallen or crashed down here. Besides the ravages of time, the old RV seemed undamaged. I stepped within a few feet of the Winnebago's open door. I fumbled through my backpack and produced my flashlight, noticing that the vehicle was ringed by a thick layer of heavy grey mud. Spurred by curiosity, I clicked my flashlight on and stepped on board the ruined RV through the broken door. As I did so, the entire vehicle let out a wretched moan as rusted springs shifted for the first time in what had likely been decades. I threw a glance back over my shoulder into the forest, suddenly feeling watched. All I noticed through the forest gloom were the neon orange X's I had painted on the trees, pointed at haphazard angles and partially hidden by gnarled trunks. The interior of the RV was dark as night, even with the gloomy daylight flickering through some of the small sections of broken windows. The stark white beams of my flashlight cut through the blackness, a circle of vision too small for comfort. Something felt off the moment I was inside. The cabin of the vehicle was almost empty. Driver and passenger seats devoured down to the metal frames by generations of vermin. A crusty lichen encased the steering column. The cup holders held two old metal thermoses. The words number one dad and number one mom just barely visible through the years of sylvan filth that had accumulated upon them. I turned my face to the main living space of the old wreck, silence thick on the air and only cut through by the agonized creaks of the moldering floor beneath me. The built-in couch here had suffered the same fate as the cabin seats, devoured by rats and insects searching for a nest. Cupboards hung open near the low ceiling, cardboard boxes of food within reduced to pulp and slurry by years of exposure. I shone my needle of light across the room noticing the narrow door at the rear. It hung barely ajar, a crack of darkness presumably leading to the RV's bedroom. As I stepped closer, the stench of mildew and wet dirt grew almost overpowering. With the groan of rusty hinges, I pushed the door open. My blood ran cold as my flashlight beam settled on what waited beyond the doorway. Shocked, my breaths came in quick and shallow as I took in the sight the room held a bed, mattress and blankets, untouched by foraging pests, but stained a deep black brown by mold and God knows what else. Upon the bed was a heap of clothing, gathered from the suitcases haphazardly left a rot on the floor around the bed. The clothes were stained the same foul shade as the mattress. I could make out at least four distinct sizes of clothing in the pile, two adults and two children. The stink of rotting vegetation was unimaginable. My hands shook, bobbing my light as they did so, as I gazed at the top of the pile. Atop the wet heap of moldy old clothing was the dripping carcass of a deer, limbs broken and twisted at unnatural angles to allow the decaying thing to be propped in a pose like a man sitting cross-legged. Its head was bowed towards me, what was left of the meat blackened by rot and slowing off its skull beneath lichen-coated antlers. Its eyes had long since liquefied, dripping down its cheeks in curdled rivulets and leaving empty black sockets to stare into the dark. The cluster of mossy and scattered headbones with the headboard revealed that this was merely the most recent animal left here, the next in a long line of slaughtered deer propped up in this macabre. Despite the dribbling animal wreckage before me, there was no smell of rotting meat, just the singularly wretched and overpowering odour of composing vegetation and decomposing fungus. Acrid vomit filled my mouth and sinuses and I bolted for the door behind me. As I stuck my head and shoulders outside and prepared to retch, my eyes laid upon a fresh horror. The bright orange of my marking paint, sprayed at haphazard and dissonant angles, 
as I had wandered the valley, all faced towards me in uniform stairs. Every X I had painted down here looked towards me, neon colour cutting through the forest gloom like electric eyes. The remainder of the food left in my stomach, replaced by ice water as I lurched forward and vomited messily upon the mossy ground. Leaning from inside the RV, body shaking with confusion and terror, I hung my head and wiped the bitter puke from my mouth and tears from my eyes. The smell of rotten wood still clogged my nostrils. I stared at the splatter of fresh vomit below me, attempting to comprehend what I was looking at. The steaming bile was collecting in a footprint in the sticky grey mud. My shaky breath rattled in my lungs as I stared. It was unmistakable. Fresh tracks marred the mud that surrounded the derelict RV, a complete circle that stalked around the vehicle. They were deep, pressed into the muck by something big and heavy. The tracks took the shape of half a human foot, the long toes and forefoot evident of the tracks of someone walking barefoot and tiptoeing. Jesus Christ, even the partial footprints were bigger than the tracks I had left. How had something so large moved so quietly around the RV? I hadn't heard a thing from inside. I rose to trembling feet and took a cautious step outside. The old growth was utterly silent beyond my nervous painting. The bright orange X's still stared in my direction. Not a one where I'd originally placed it. Damn it, damn it, damn it, I thought to myself. I stood, scanning the empty forest floor and listening for any sounds that pierced the quiet. Seconds passed, feeling like an eternity. And then, I bolted. Blood pounded in my ears as I sprinted through the forest, never once slowing as I made for camp. The feeling of a cold, calculating gaze from unseen eyes never left my back as I ran. I skidded into my tiny camp on the edge of the stand as the sun began to dip in the darkening sky, nearly collapsing with exhaustion as the daylight that filtered through the trees above began to die. As I panted and gasped with exertion, I surveyed my surroundings. My tent and firing appeared untouched since I left this morning. As dusk settled over the forest, my surroundings began to darken. It wouldn't be long until they were as black as the old growth of my back. There was no way I could leave tonight. Even if I wasn't petrified to be out in the dark, there wasn't a chance in hell I could find my way back to Piper through the black and unfamiliar woods. My mind raced as daylight failed around me. Do I set a fire and hope light and flames keeps whatever was out there at bay? Or do I sit in darkness and pray that I stay hidden in a shadowy and silent camp? There were no good options. My bowels knotted inside me as I fought to keep panic from setting in. Eventually, the primal instincts of my cave-dwelling ancestors kicked in. Fire was the one tool that had always served our kind against the darkness and the things that lurked within it. I piled all of my firewood into the ring. I wouldn't need it for another night, and as night fell, the glowing light of my bonfire lit the forest around me, faltering at the edges of the old growth. My camp bathed in firelight. I climbed inside my tent and sealed the zipper shut. I sat silently inside the thin neon shell for hours, listening as the wind made the only sound beyond the crackling of my fire which glowed through the walls of the tent. My hands shook as my spine prickled with nerves, my teeth chattering despite the humid heat that clung to my body, sweat dripping from my brow. I moved slowly to check my watch. 3.30am. Less than two hours until the first break of daylight. Less than two hours until I could flee this place. I jolted as a sudden snap shattered the silence. The sharp cracking noise emanated not 20 feet from my tent and followed by staccato rustling before deathly silence. My eyes were wide, breath caught in my throat. The quiet, nearly imperceptible rustling came again. Whatever was outside was still there. I slowly grasped the zipper pull with my left hand while fumbling about with my right until it came to rest upon my pocket knife. It was a feeble little thing, barely helpful as a tool for whittling, 
but as a gift from my dad, it always found its way into my pack. With my impotent little blade clutched tight, I opened the door of my tent, agonizingly slowly to keep the zipper quiet. I crept out into the night, the chill air shockingly cold as it connected with my overheated and clammy skin. The bonfire still burned, though it had run low as the night dragged on. Silently surveying the camp before me, I searched for the source of the hushed sound. Slowly, my gaze was drawn upwards into the boughs of the trees. Two eyes reflected in the firelight, staring back at me. Shock gripped my heart, and it took all of my willpower not to exclaim with fear and surprise. The eyes cocked to the side, as if judging me. With more quiet rustles, the owl shifted on its branch. Close enough that the firelight revealed its identity. Relief flooded my body, and I let out a quiet sigh. Then, true terror overtook me as I noticed the huge shape in my peripheral vision. I slowly turned my head, tears welling up in my eyes. It sat, waiting on its haunches, barely six feet away from me, dimly lit by the embers of the slowly dying fire. At first, I thought it was a huge man, a giant living in the woods, but this thing was no human. Never could have been. It sat, nearly curled in a fetal ball, long arms clasped to its scrawny legs and shoulders hunched. Completely naked, its humanoid form was covered in greasy, pale skin stretched taut over knobby bones and joints. Black grey veins pulsed beneath its thin flesh. The thing's elongated arms and legs were triple jointed, digitigrade, like the hind legs of a repulsively malnourished and hairless goat. Its arms ended in hands, each bearing six long and twitching fingers tipped with ragged and blackened nails. Its legs terminated in feet that may have been human, if they were not twisted and deformed to allow the thing to walk on its mud and filth cake toes. It carried an unbearable stench of fungus and compost, but most horrible of all was its face. Atop its spindly neck rested the thing's gaunt head, oily and pale skin reflecting the guttering flames in the fire pit. Its nose and chin were hideously long and crooked, not unlike the jagged and pointed features stereotypical of ancient witches. Its mouth was wide and lipless, flesh pulled back to reveal black gums and long, blunted teeth that looked as if they had been taken from a human jaw and stretched cartoonishly to fit this horror skull. Though it had no eyes, it stared intently at the owl in the tree. No, not eyeless. The twisted and hulking creature crouched beside me, slowly turned its head to face me. Barely visible, white orbs rolled and twitched in sunken eye sockets, bulging beneath a pallid and thin membrane of flesh. The horror stared silently at me, before raising a single finger to its lipless and drooling teeth. It let out a quiet, gurgling breath. Shh. Panic set my body ablaze. I scrambled to my feet, dropping my tiny pocket knife into the mud. The owl let out a shrieking protest as it took flight, spooked by my sudden movement. As I stumbled backwards, starting my sprint into the pitch black forest, the thing rose to its feet on tri jointed legs. Good God! The thing had to have been at least seven feet tall, but its body moved without making a sound. As I turned and ran, it let out a hideous, gasping screech, a sound laden with ancient hate. I didn't look back, dashing through the underbrush, away from the old growth, and leaving an empty tent to join the others Randy had found. I don't know if it followed me. It was so big, but it moved so silently. As I ran, I didn't see it, didn't hear it, but the feeling of its gaze never left me. I ran, blindly in the dark, whipping branches and bramble thorns slashing my face and hands seemingly to ribbons. Blood and sweat drenched me, pooling in my hiking boots. I don't know how long I ran. At some point, I must have collapsed with exhaustion, 
blacking out in the depths of the forest. I woke up in the glaring shine of daylight, filtering down onto my face through the trees. My face and hands were caked with blood and dirt. At least two of my fingers were broken, or at least dislocated. Rising on shaking legs, I began my blind trek into the unfamiliar woods around me, hopelessly lost. I walked for hours, likely wandering in circles. My face and hands ached with dull, pulsing pain. The skin of my chest itched and burned beneath my shirt. Finally, I stumbled into the forest trail, old and ill-maintained. I couldn't believe my luck. I'd resigned myself to being lost, dying alone and hunted deep in unsettling Appalachia. Tears welled up as I hurriedly limped down the path, and I nearly shouted with elation when Piper came into view. Fumbling with my keys, I managed to unlock her and climb inside, slamming and locking the door behind me. As I fired the ignition and the truck started up, the burning of my chest intensified, an awful itching sensation. Grimacing, I quickly set about undoing the button on my shirt to see what the cause of my discomfort was. As I did so, a subtle stench of old vegetation began wafting into my truck. I felt cold eyes staring from the fingers of the woods. I pulled my shirt open, exposing my chest and the source of the itch. Across the flesh of my chest, sprayed there with marker paint, was a bright orange X.